Hi, it's Sifa. Um, this is a story that I wrote about recovering from anorexia. Um, I wrote it not too long ago in the fall semester. So just maybe four months ago or so. Okay. It's called For a Dark Girl. I can't write anymore, I told my therapist, Corey. Really? Why do you think that is? She asked. Well, I hate to be that typical bitter writing student, but I had this asshole professor who just, I don't know, he just kind of killed my inspiration. Ever since I finished the fall semester, I haven't written a single poem in like a month. I fiddle with my purple pen, taking it apart and putting it back together. It's an important task requiring all of my concentration. How well can you take criticism? Corey asks. I love getting criticism. It's just that he could not even find a single good thing to say about anything I wrote. He basically just gave up on me. He literally told me, Sifa, I can't help you anymore. I sigh in frustration, staring at the carpet. I squeeze the spring from the pen between my fingers and it flies across the room. Just give it some time, she says. A bad class won't kill your inspiration forever. I'm just not used to this, I said. All spring and summer, I had a natural flow to my thoughts. Phrases and words would just float through my mind effortlessly. I kept a notebook. I still have it here. I pull out a battered notebook from my purse and read it. I don't know what happened, but the inspiration is gone and I'm pissed. There's a pause in the conversation. How's your relationship with Luke? Corey asks. Oh, it's great. We haven't been fighting much at all lately. You know, it's about to be our third anniversary. God, I can't believe it's been that long. How fucking disturbing. After the appointment, I have to rush home to eat my lunch. It's one o'clock on the spot and I'm late. I'm going to starve to death. Fuck. When I get home, I ram my key into the front lock, throw my jacket on the floor, and rummage fr frantically through a stack of papers on the dining room table to find my meal chart. I carefully measure out three quarters cup of black beans, a cup of brown rice, a quarter of an avocado. I scoop the avocado out with a knife, almost cutting my thumb open as I rush. I slice up a cup of fresh broccoli and a cup of snap peas. I curse out loud as I spill the beans on the floor. God fucking damn it, I'm so fucking clumsy and I'm just trying to eat. Why can't I even eat? My head begins to throb with irritation. I sit down in front of the television, watching some trashy reality show as I eat. I'm not even hungry, but I shovel the food into my mouth between chugs of Diet Coke. My heart rate slows. The alarm on my cell phone goes off. It must be 1.30. I hastily search through my purse, locating my meds, pick out a blue one and a white diamond-shaped one, chase them with more Diet Coke, and sit down. I finish my meal in about four minutes. My stomach cramps from the, from the amount of food in it. In four hours, it will be 5.30. What will I eat then? Oh my god, I don't even know. That night, I wash my makeup off in the bathroom mirror. The bright orange walls make my face glow strangely. What face is that? Is my face the pretty one or the ugly one? I don't know how much longer I can do this. The pretty girl that I used to be is dying. I gave this a genuine shot and it's just not for me. I can't love myself like this. Fuck this. I'm going to call Corey and tell her that I'm not going to see her anymore. My insurance doesn't cover her anyway. It's so ridiculous that I'm paying this woman so much money and I don't even have any plans of sticking to this fat diet. I glare at my scale. It's cracked in the middle. I shudder. Last time I weighed myself, I stopped eating and lost eight pounds in a week. The next morning, my alarm clock goes off at nine. Muttering curses, I force myself to get up and dress in my workout clothes, which for some reason are the only clothes that still fit me. As I enter the glass door to the studio, I begin to slow my breathing. The serenity of the meditation music and the sunlight filtering through the orange and blue stained glass reminds me of my journey and the real reason why I'm changing. Okay, just making sure it's recording. I lay out my yoga mat and sit in the very back of the room away from all the mirrors. Good morning, everyone. Let's start off in a seated posture. Find a comfortable position and move the flesh to allow your sits bones to connect with the floor. Really ground into the floor and feel the weight of your body against it, the teacher says. 
When she says move the flesh, she is really referring to my giant ass. I gently push this thought aside. The teacher is named, Mar named Miranda. I've been taking classes with her for almost a year now, but I've been kind of changing up my practice lately. Her voice is like a kindergarten teacher reading a fairy tale to children. It's annoying at first, but then pulls you in with the story that you create. I breathe in my nose and slowly out my mouth. Tranquility sleeps, sweeps over me like a delicate powder. I try to find meaning in the grains of the wood floor. I hear secrets in the music. My mind has flipped over to its healthy side for now. Miranda says, Before we start, I want everyone to think of a dedication for their practice today. I'm sitting in a half lotus posture, my hands open on my knees. My eyes are closed. Today, I'm going to work on loving positive things about myself and building my identity. I am more than self-destruction. I am a work of art. I am a poet. I am kind. I am strong. I am loving. It's true that I really don't believe any of this, but maybe one day I will. Miranda says, now let's move into tabletop. We warm up from the chill January air. As we pro progress into more difficult postures and the flow speeds up, we do chaturanga after chaturanga and my triceps are burning. We hold warrior postures until my thighs shake and I'm covered in sweat. I'm now screaming in my head. I deserve help. I am a good fucking person, but I'm getting so fat. Shut the fuck up. I only listen to the healthy voice now. You've gained almost 15 pounds already. Stop lying. Stop it. I'm healthy now and I'm happy. I'm healthy now. I'm healthy now and I'm happy. I'm healthy. Through the stained glass, I can see the sun coming out from behind the clouds. I'll lie until I believe it. I think I've realized something big, I tell Corey at our next session. Yeah, what is it, she said. I always thought that I was different from the other anorexics because they were afraid of their disease. They thought they were so weak and that anything could make them relapse. When I was in the psych ward, they would always talk about how walking by the Isle of Fashion magazines was so terrifying and I never understood. They always talked about how much they wanted to recover and how they were working so hard to get better. I would not allow myself to lie like that. I never wanted to get better. I loved being anorexic. It made me feel like I was better than other people. I was hardcore. I could starve myself for days and I was skinny and badass. I was in treatment for years and I never wanted to recover. Now though, I think that maybe I was wrong. Maybe all those years I really did want to get better and it was really just my disease telling me that I didn't want to. Corey smiles at me. I look into her eyes for a moment and then my eyes take their glance to the carpet where they usually stay. The carpet is a boring red and purple geometric pattern. She needs to get a more interesting carpet, like one with unicorns frolicking around in a magical forest or something, I think. When you first came here a few months ago, Corey says, you were so sick, you were only eating, she rifles through her folders, 500 calories a day. She looks at me sadly. And now you're working so hard, eating three times a day, meditating, being honest with your friends and family, and exercising moderately. You have made incredible progress, Sifa. You should be very proud of yourself. I'll try to be, I said. 500 calories a day? 500 calories a day? I forgot how perfect I was then. I go home and pull up my laptop to try to write. I'm writing a poem about a kitten, but it's shit and I delete it. My heart is racing from seeing Corey. I'm obsessed with relapsing and how good everything used to be. I open the folder from the, from the fall semester. It's full of all my pro-Anna poems. I smile as I read about my lost love starvation. There are pictures in the folder too of my favorite fashion models. All of a sudden my chest seizes then a sharp pain. It's not my heart though. I've had that checked out enough lately. I notice that I'm covered in a cold sweat, burning up. My nails are cutting into my palms. My chest tightens as I gasp for breath. I take off all my clothes, naked in my room, desperate to cool down. My phone vibrates. I see Luke's picture on the screen, making a ridiculous duck face. I can't talk to him right now. Catching a glimpse of myself in the mirror, I curse and turn it around. My disease is making decisions for me now. I find myself in the bathroom at my clean toilet. 
I'm throwing everything up. I'm choking. I'm crying. I get vomit in my hair. Finally, I'm empty. Like I should be. Like I deserve to be. Fuck this. All I ever wanted to be was normal. How could I ask for more than I can eat? I have nightmares every night of feasts where I can't stop shoving food down my throat. I think, how? How am I going to get rid of all this? Tomorrow I will be the world. Tomorrow I'll be back to where I was when I was sad. I have to stop this. I have to stop the scale from turning. My skirt swirls clockwise when I dance in the freeze, and maybe I can shiver this thick coat off my body. Maybe if I shake enough. Maybe if he really loves me. Maybe if he told me the honest fucking truth. There is a small voice in the back. I know how he sees me, and it makes my stomach turn black. There's a possibility that his lies might mean something. If I could believe. It's not a lie if I try to believe it. I pull out a piece of paper and a sharpie and write fuck you all over it, then scratch everything out, making the whole page black and angry. I turn the page over and write, he loves you, as small as I can. Hey baby, I run to Luke and bury my face in his leather jacket. Sweetheart, are you ready for our special date? Can you believe it's been three years? Luke, I frown and pull away, his long black hair sticking to my face. What's wrong, Sifar? Are you feeling okay? I just, I mean, I, I, I mean, I've told you. I was gonna say it. You have to give me a chance. I was gonna say how beautiful you look tonight, he said. Oh, really? I perk up in mock surprise. How so? Uh, well, he racks his brain for details. Your shoes look really nice with that bow, he tries. Thanks, Luke. I love you. Where are we going? Your favorite restaurant, of course, Sukotai, he said. I don't know, Luke, what am I going to eat there? I begin to panic, counting calories and imagining what my body will look like tomorrow morning. Sifa, it'll be fine, I promise. He holds the door for me as I enter the small brick building. My mouth waters as I smell, as I am surrounded by the savory smells from the gourmet kitchen. We take a booth by the window. There's a tiny spider starting a web in the corner of the window frame. I feel bad because by tonight, it may finish its web but the closing staff will probably have to sleep, sweep it away. All its hard work will have been for nothing. The menu scares me. It's black and moldy and tearing apart. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to be healthy. I am a good person. I love myself. Breathe deeply. Luke loves me. I am a poet. I am moving on from my eating disorder. I am leaving it behind. I am past anorexia. I am free. I am free. I am free. I order glass noodles with tofu. Luke orders green curry with chicken. I'm okay. We eat and it's not a big deal. I want to throw it up, but I don't. I talk myself out of it. After dinner, we walk down Frenchman Street. The cold January air reminds me of dark times. I feel like if I could write, I would be doing a lot better, I tell Luke. I think you're doing pretty well, Luke smiles at me. I mean, to be honest, I'm kind of a bad writer because I always write about the same thing. You know this, I nod to him. I always write about dark girls. Girls that are in love with suffering and pain. I really should learn to write about something else because it's been like this since I was 14. Yeah, you need to write about something else, especially now that you're doing so much better, he agrees. I've tried, you know, I've tried to write about happy bullshit, but it all comes out cliche and sappy sounding. All the love poems I've written for you are depressing too. How is that even possible? I ask him. The truth is, Luke, I'm still struggling a lot. Every day I want to quit this. Every fucking time I take a bite, I dream of how things used to be so perfect. But I know it's really a lie, I tell myself. I just have to keep reminding myself of what I want. I don't think you give yourself enough credit, Sifa. You've worked so hard. You have to learn to recognize that you're working hard at this. I feel my stomach relax. It's happy that it has food in it. There's something so sacred in feeding yourself. My legs feel strong as we walk. I send my love to the dark sky. I receive love from the darkness inside. I let go. I move on. The businesses are bright inside. The people are out. This is peace. 
I breathe in deeply. I close my eyes as I walk blindly and hold loosely onto Luke's arm. I trust that I will not trip. It's scary walking like this, but every atom in the universe is loving me right now. All the galaxies make up the shape of my shining body. Looking at Luke, I catch a glimpse of myself in a store window. I'm smiling. Somehow that smile makes me happy. I didn't even notice anything else. Maybe nothing else matters if we're smiling. Thank you guys, that's the end. <laughs>